and Jack, I never met you before, but you set me up so perfect for this talk, so right on. Um, so um, thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, this work is a paper that we have, so we're giving a data paper today. Um, so this is a little bit different than some, a lot of the talks have been data papers, we're gonna do a data paper. Um, we just have it in review right now um, in restoration ecology, we just got it out. Um, with collaborators from the yeah. Nantucky Conservation Foundation and the Land Bank, and um, also funding from Mass Fish and Wildlife. So thanks to everyone there. So we're going to be talking about the effects of adaptive management, well, disturbed space management, um, uh, over pretty long term, and maybe for, for us, I guess, over about 10 years' time, um, on two sites in uh, coastal sampling communities on Nantucket Island. Um, so, coastal sampling communities um, are globally rare. Uh, coastal habitats comprised of grassland and heathland species, and um, and very important because they have a big wooly wetland urban interface issue associated with them. So, not only are they restricted globally in terms of being um, in New England or northeastern coastal habitats. But also, um, you know, these sites that I'm talking about, people are driving their Jeeps to the beach, right, as you're out there sampling, right? It's a nice place to sample, like that you're in your car hearts looking at the ocean in there with their surfboard, right? Um, but at any rate, in Nantucket, um, the, in Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod, principal locations in, in Massachusetts where they're found, found elsewhere as well, in the Northeast. Um, and so, we know that fire, uh, important in these systems, right? So we have a lot of ericaceous shrubs, which in, indicates that um, probably something fire adapted, they re-sprout after fire. Uh, of course, here in the Northeast, the extent to which natural fires happened prior to Euro-American settlement um, is, is, is somewhat difficult to differentiate, but we do know that the lightning fires happen all over the Northeast, um, especially in exposed to open sites, right? So fire and salt spray um, was important in terms of regulating uh, vegetation composition when we think about sort of natural disturbance factors that are <coughs> regulating the species matrix, right? The other thing about them is that, you know, they're really important not only in terms of thinking about um, habitat as being uh, not very extensive on, on face of the earth, but also um, they are, uh, there are a number of state-listed um, endangered plants in this area, and they also are habitat for other important species of conservation interest, including um, the northern harrier and um, multiple species of Lepidoptera. Um, so, as with fire, you guys all know this, the extent to, so people came on to the scene in New England pretty close to when the glaciers melted, right? And so, differentiating the effects of natural fires versus human ignitions is, is a little bit difficult, right? Because people have been interacting with this landscape since they recolonized, recolonized it at the same time as plants are coming in and all these other sorts of things um, to, uh, with deglaciation, right? Um, and so Native Americans are well documented on the island of Nantucket. Um, we know from Stephen Pine's book on Fire in America that um, a lot of other historical work that um, Native Americans, and you know, I made sure that this is a longhouse, it's something that you know, people actually used here in New England. Um, they, they used fire for a variety of different reasons, right? Um, so keeping trade routes open, um, flushing game, but also for promoting the regeneration of lots of masting tree species uh, with, that have you know, protein value from the nuts that they produce, and also um, to promote the regeneration of uh, um, plants like low bush blueberry, like huckleberry, all these wonderful plants that are not only serve as food to humans, but also food to animals. So we know that, that on Nantucket Native Americans were, were there and they used fire, for sure, okay? And so, um, in, these, in these sites. And so this is, um, basically what you're seeing here is on this y-axis, this is age, these are, this is a, a sediment core with um, basically dated, so you have age deeper in the core is older, and then younger, these were radiocarbon dated, and then these are different species of plants, and um, the magnitude of the abundance of different pollen, so pollen counts, right? And so basically what we see is there are a lot of tree species, and, you know, it sort of goes with the deglaciation, so we had lots of spruce and pine coming in right after deglaciation, and then the heavier seeded um, plants came in later, right? So that pretty much follows what we know for the Northeast in terms of thinking about colonization of plants after um, the melting of the glaciers. But what we see in this paper is that this documents very well 
the increase in grass and agricultural wheat pollen that corresponds to Euro-American settlement, right? So when we had the colonial era, colonial era, there was heavy land clearing, hay, pasturing, all the same kinds of land uses that people used in, you know, jolly old England came right over here. And, and we have, so what we see is a change from uh, tree dominance, bayberry, other kinds of shrub dominance, to now grass dominance in the colonial era, right? And this is a story that I, most of you guys know this story, right? But I'm just trying to set you up for the punchline. Okay? So, um, so really, um, in Nantucket, it was it was the head of the capital of the whaling industry until the formation of the New Bedford Colony, right? So we had up to sixty thousand head of sheep grazing Nantucket Island on the Nantucket Sheep Commons during the peak of the whaling industry, along with other kinds of agricultural land uses as well, right? And so that represents a chronic and generally a twelve-month kind of disturbance that shifted the vegetation towards dominance by herbaceous species, right? Graminoids, forbs, right? And so, um, and then in the late 1700s, or teen, early 1800s, what do we see? Well, we see the, a decline in the whaling industry. That means less people and less agriculture, fewer animals on the island of Nantucket. And so what we see historically is this picture from the Nantucket Historical Association transforming to something that is much more shrub dominated, right? And so, um, and then there are data to go with it, right? So we see this is for Cape Cod and the islands, that should include Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, right? For Massachusetts, from Foster and Moskin's paper. But basically we see the percent of land under tillage goes down over time. The number of sheep goes down over time. The number of cattle goes down over time. Co that cor corresponds to the removal of agriculture as the predominant sort of land use at, at, on the Nantucket once the whaling industry dropped, right? And then when we look at tillage, so what we see here is out here by Co2, there was not a lot of plus so open circles are unplowed, black squares are plowed. So the majority of the island, I mean, it's hard to get out here, you gotta have a Jeep. Um, but basically, most of the island, soiled or tilled at some point in time, right? And so this is really important because when we talk about changes over time, so these are basically paired to the same site, more or less, um, matched up with um, historical association photos. And what you see is, yeah, there were shrubs in this landscape, historically, right? We had a matrix of vegetation, but um, there were mostly a lot of ground noise, a lot of forbs, right? And then um, what we see down here is today there's been a lot of shrub encroachment, right? And so, um, so basically, so why should we care about that? Well, this gets to the punchline of what we're doing here, but um, the question that we were sort of trying to answer here is over um, using single and or repeated burns and mowing, um, can we use disturbance-based management to um, promote the regeneration of herbaceous taxa, right? That's the question that we're looking at in this study. Um, now, of course, it's pretty value-laden, right? So we're trying to say, oh, we want ground woods and forbs, which is an artifact of like colonial land clearing, right? So there, that's always like a really difficult thing, I think, when we talk about adaptive management, if we sort of say, oh, well, you know, we want these herbaceous species that, that are an artifact of a colonial, like agrarian lifestyle. So, but when we think about why we would want to do that is because there are a lot, we're seeing a decline to the point where a lot of these species are getting listed on, on state lists, right? And so if you want to think about maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem function, right? You want to maintain a matrix of these species, right? So we want to have shrubs, we want to have gra grasses, we want to have forbs, and we want to have them all there because they will also provide <coughs> habitat for other species as you move up the trophic levels, right? So, um, so you know, it's an anthropogenic kind of question, but I, I think I think it's okay to say, yeah, you know what? We're we're going to use adaptive management to try to promote forb and grass regeneration. I think that's okay to say, right? Um, and so we had two data sets that we pooled for this study. One was Smooth Hummocks property um, run by the Nantucket Land Bank. That's a mitigation project that goes through 2025 using repeated fires and mowing, right? Um, and then Head of the Plains, um, I should use the two sides, Head of the Plains is down here. They were pretty close by each other, pretty similar species composition, and so we pulled the two data sets using one meter square frame data on vegetation cover. 
Um, we basically just looked at whether the site was treated or not treated because while there was mowing that was done on this, it wasn't done super consistently and it wasn't done with the same kind of frequency as the burn data. And the two sites are a little bit different, right? One, at, hot, at, at head of the plains, it was only treated once with fires. Smooth hummocks has been, treat, been treated multiple times. Right, but so we, we, we made some approaches to try to aggregate those differences in management history across the data set. Um, and so we did a bunch of different statistical analyses. Everybody loves a good statistics slide, right? Um, so we did ordination, we did indicator species analysis, analysis of similarity, mixed models to try to understand, well, what, what are the temporal changes in plant cover by species, by taxonomic group, um, over, this, over the time series, and also, with time since treatment. So we used, I, I'm going to be presenting a lot of slides that have time since treatment to deal with the fact that one site was only treated once, right? And another site's been treated repeated times, right? Um, and so I did a whole bunch of other analyses as well, but I'm going to focus on the ones that, that, that came through. So basically, the, the goal was increase grass cover, increase herbaceous species. That didn't work so well, <laughs> okay? So this was a real test to a scientist to, and the reason why I did a bazillion analyses is because I'm like, oh my god, these people spent hundreds of thousands of dollars doing adaptive management for like 10 years on the side. I really want to give them some good news, right? I want to tell them, what you're doing is totally working. Well, okay, so here's what we see. This is time since treatment, right? Pre-treatment is the first one. And then this is relative cover. Um, and so what we see is, uh, you see a decline, significant decline. These are mixed models results. All the results are here. Um, uh, decline in floor cover, cover and an increase in woody plant cover. Significant over the time series. And when you plot them all together, you can really see that trend, right? So what we're seeing is time since treatment it shows an increase in woody plant cover and a decline. And it makes sense, right? So I told you guys they're all shrub, they're acacia shrubs, they re-sprout, right? So when we talk about the reorganization of the growing space, right? You see, the, you see that these woody plants can recapture it, and they can recapture it kind of at this threshold of three years. So you're going to see that three-year timeline a bunch of times in all of these graphs. And that's really sort of important when we think about, well, what does that mean for management? What should we do about that? Because that's the window we're working with in terms of thinking about these shrubs coming back in and holding that site. Um, so here's an ordination. And what this is, is it's plots. That's pre-treatment plots are the red open triangles, and then post-treatment plots are the green closed triangles. And basically these are plots in species space. So these are basically showing you um, what, and then it's plotted with convex hulls around the pre-treatment time step and the post-treatment time, time step. And what we see is the pre-treatment time step had, step had a lot of variation in species composition across the plots. Um, the post-treatment group had less variation, but that the convex hulls overlap, right? So that means no big shift in species composition over time. And this is like pre-treatment versus the last interval that the plot was sampled, right? So this is kind of getting that big trend of, well, do we see shifting dominance? I did indicator species analysis on the pre-treatment group and the post-treatment group, not significant. So you're not seeing a change in the dominant species or the species that indicate, indicator species of the two different time steps, if that makes sense. Um, also did a bunch of analysis of similarity results on the two different um, time steps. And what do we see? Well, it's, it's significant, but thank God I don't round up, right? 0 0.47, it's tight, right? But so we do see some, some, some species that are responsible for this shift that we do see. And those are things like Galassacea baccata, Carex pensylvanica, that's Pennsylvania sedge from the last talk, right? Festuca, so we do see some changes. Um, that, that are happening, but they're marginally significant. Right? Um, and so we did this other totally human value thing, laden thing. We, um, we categorized things into desirable <coughs> and undesirable. Um, thanks. So, um, and so basically what we said was, well, you know, like something like a huckleberry or a low bush blueberry is something that is, it's a shrub, right? It's a woody plant. Um, but it's not really aggressively competing with a lot of the herbaceous taxa. And so we're going to say that that's a desirable woody species, right? Um, but something like Euphamia is a really pretty aggressive um, forb species that can outcompete with a lot of, um, of the or other herbaceous taxa that might be, we might want to see coming onto the site. 
And we see the same thing. So over time, there's a decrease in the desired taxa and an increase in the undesired taxa with time since treatment, right? And we see this, oh, there's that, like, you really start to see those significant changes occurring at three years. So, and, and not right away. There aren't, so if you look at time, like this line and this versus this, those, over, those error bars overlap, right? And these error bars overlap. So you don't see that significant change until a little bit later, right? Um, so there's a little lag effect. Um, okay, so now we'll break it out. Well, let's look at individual taxa, taxa, do some mixed models to look at what's going on with um, individual species. And basically, here are the grasses. And we see some variation, but we see that there is a decline that happens. Sometimes it's lag, sometimes it's immediate for different species. Um, one other thing that I want to point out is like the, dealing with rare taxa like Juncus greenii, some of the Poaceae, like they have very, very little low cover values as well. And so it's kind of hard to actually get an estimate of what's going on with that. I also did, we also did some things where we did some frequency counts because we, some of them were nested designs and actually didn't matter very much. So, but this whole rare plant thing is, is tough to deal with. But in general, we see a decline in gra grasses, over, grasses over time. And you can really see that, just through this Pennsylvania said, you can see that transition happen between years two and three very well, right? Um, okay, and there were some other species that weren't significant. Um, okay, for cover, overall decrease, and um, this is the same deal, like uh, your cover value, even for euthymia, that's something that can sometimes cover a large proportion of the one meter frame that you're sampling in, um, still not very, individual species, you don't see significant changes in the forbs, right? You see the community level change in the forbs, but because, so this is, I'm just saying this because that's something that's really hard when you're trying to get, trying to figure out effectiveness of, of restoration treatments for increasing forb cover, well, which forbs, right? And, and if they're really rare, that's a real challenge when you're thinking about how to, how, metrics for evaluating success, right? Um, okay, shrubs, guess what? They all went up, right, over time. And, and you, you do see that threshold again. So, so I'm just showing you the same thing. I could have just given you one slide. It could have been all over 10 minutes ago, right? But now I at least get to see uh, some individual um, species in their responses, right? Um, and um, if we talk about number of times treated, didn't really matter. You can treat it once, treat it twice, treat it three times. But the other thing about this is that these were dormant season burns, right? So Jack, thank you for setting me up for this, right? So we don't see a big response. Nantucket Island, super popular place. I love going there, going back three times next summer. Right, right. Who doesn't want to do research on Nantucket, right? <laughs> so, but, because of that very narrow burn window, there's not a real big opportunity to apply fire to the landscape during, during the growing season, you know. Um, so, summary. It's really difficult to restore these landscapes using, so you're talking about a system that has experienced several centuries of chronic disturbance to shift it towards an herbaceous species matrix, right? Then, oh, several centuries of like, no agriculture, no chronic disturbance, no fire, right? And you have the shrub matrix, and all these plants re-sprout after fire, right? So it becomes very difficult. There's a, real, a really big am amount of resilience in this population, right? So, and, and we now, at least for this study, we're able to identify that this, there's this three-year window, right? And after three years, you really see some big changes. And that becomes a challenge, too, because you know, these are fuel-driven systems as well. So saying that you could just, you know, apply fire at a more frequent interval becomes a challenge when you might not be able to get it to burn after three years, right? Um, and so really it's about sort of the recovery of this growing space by these shrub plants within three years and then they hold the site. And we've seen this elsewhere. The Middle Moors property that Peter Dunwoody worked on, same deal, the containment property as well on Martha Dinner to see a lot of the same kinds of trends in these coastal sampling communities. And so, so recommendations. I'd be happy to talk with you guys um, more about this, but you know, sort of what we're trying to work with or try to figure out is, you know, when can we do hotter <coughs> fires? And I think growing season burns are really important, and those are the kinds of things that we're, we're trying to figure out how to do, right? Um, burning in conjunction with other kinds of fire and fire surrogates. So can we do mowing more and maybe do mowing at, at a time that and then we maybe could follow up or mop up with a prescribed fire later because we have fuels available to actually carry a fire across the landscape. Um, and so, um, 
burning at more frequent rotation intervals, right? Um, that's the idea is, well, maybe we can extend that window past three years' time, right? And so, um, so those are, I mean, this is part of the adaptive management sort of framework, right? We're now sitting here at this reevaluation stage of going, okay, well, the smooth hummocks property has um, a mitigation that's going through 2025, so we're going to continue to manage that site into the future. So how can we change what we're doing now to, to achieve more desired results, right? And also, you know, prescribed fire in New England, as we know, is, is something, it's a learning process. We're still learning more and more about how to, how to work in these systems. Um, so the question remains, really, you know, how do we move from this to something that looks more like this? Um, and so we're still uncertain, but we're still working on that question, and um, I think so. We have to answer some questions. Yep. So um, understanding that, you know, different species need different scales, uh, how, did you look at patch size at all? Because um, how important is it to get to that condition on the right? for all the species out there, and can you be looking at smaller scale patches for the grasses versus versus? Right, so we were, so we did have, um, so because we wanted to be able to use the two sites, we use the one meter frame data, and it doesn't really get at that, right? But we do also have three meter frame data for the smooth hummock, smooth hummock site, which was, the design was to be able to get at that kind of question, but we haven't explicitly analyzed it in that fashion. You know, Pat, but I agree with you, right? So when we're talking about sort of landscape scale vegetation mosaics, you're gonna still wanna have a shrub component, right? You still need that. And you know, like Northern Harrier is a ground nester and it needs a shrub component to it in order to be able to um, survive and reproduce in that habitat, right? Um, but yeah, so I think there's there's a lot of, and they've also, so in, because this is a long-term study, you're kind of locked in, you know, you guys all know this, you're locked into your sampling design now, right? And so um, so that was one of the recommendations from my report on this project, which is basically like, okay, well, before you change your management, maybe you should go out and survey all these plots again. And they did do that last summer. Um, and, then, and then now, moving forward, if you're going to change stuff, fine, but, you know, we... It's always like it's always a conundrum, right? Of like, well, do we maintain the integrity of the long-term data set? And if we add new stuff, that's fine. But then you then you got new stuff, right? So yeah, it's difficult. Yep. So um, experiment with plaster we started in 1983. So pretty clearly. See, that's great student work right there. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? 